Good morning. Please be seated. The court meets this morning to hear Croatia's response to Serbia's counterclaims. I shall now give the floor to Sir Keir Starmer. You have the floor, sir. Uh, Mr. President, members of the court, I will deal with the factual and evidentiary matters arising from the respondent's counterclaim. Professor Sands will then deal with the legal issues before the agent of Croatia uh, makes closing submissions. Mr. President, so far as the counterclaim is concerned, the shelling or artillery attacks on towns and villages in the Kraina has always been central to the respondent's case. But having carefully read and reread the transcripts of proceedings in court last Friday afternoon, one can't help concluding that the respondent has lost confidence in its own counterclaim. In its written pleadings, the respondent always put its case by arguing, and I hope there's a quote on your screens, the Kraina Serbs were attacked by deliberate, indiscriminate shelling in order to be forced to flee their homes, towns and villages. That has been the constant backbone to the whole displacement theory. On Friday, just one half sentence was devoted by Professor Shabas in support of that original position uh, when he said, and this is how he put it, Serbia is not making any concession. Its position is that the artillery bombardments were unlawful. And neither Mr. Jordash nor Mr. Obradovic has spent any time trying to sustain the respondent's original position. Instead, Professor Shabas devoted a considerable part of his speech to a proposition which he sought to maintain was hypothetical. The proposition was as follows, and again, I hope this is on your screen. Even if the shelling was not unlawful, and even if the intent was not to displace the Serbs forcibly, a point which Serbia raises only for the sake of argument, those who schemed at Bryony may have concluded that lawful shelling would be enough to affect the removal of the Serbs, at least from the four towns. If that were in their intent, regardless of the means they chose to employ, the conspiracy at Bryony would still be criminal in nature. Mr. President, members of the court, what led Professor Shabas to devote no less than eight paragraphs, you'll see in the transcript, of his final speech on his final day to flying this hypothetical kite? The answer, in part, of course, is the decision of the Appeals Chamber in Gotovina. As I demonstrated in my first round speech, unless this court is tempted into some wholly unconventional judge-ranking exercise, the decision of the Appeal Chamber in Gotovina that, firstly, Operation Storm artillery attacks were not unlawful, and secondly, that no intent forcibly to displace Serbs could be inferred are and remain highly persuasive. The point I made last time, and I don't repeat now, is that that is in effect the end of the counterclaim, unless you're persuaded to adopt a different approach uh, to the ICTY findings. But there is another reason why the respondent has in reality abandoned its original position. It is this. Even if, contrary to my argument, you were persuaded by the respondent to depart from the approach to ICTY findings set out in the Bosnia case, the respondent has, rather embarrassingly, finished its case 
without setting out how you should approach your task in assessing for yourselves whether the artillery attacks are unlawful. Mr. Obradovic simply uh, told you that, and I quote, this court can form its own view on this issue. That's the invitation from the respondent. This court can form its own view on this issue. The issue, of course, being whether the artillery attacks were legitimate and thus lawful or indiscriminate and thus unlawful. As to how, absent any assistance from Gotovina, which of course you're invited to put to one side, the court should form its own view, the respondent is conspicuously silent. Mr. President, members of the court, in reality, absent Gotovina, there are only two real options. Option one, if you abandon the appeal chamber in Gotovina, is that you could revert to the 200 metre standard used at first instance to distinguish between legitimate and indiscriminate artillery attacks. You could go back to that position, the first instance position. At least there was a comprehensive analysis of where the missiles fell and the employing of a 200 metre standard to determine whether they were legitimate or, or, or not in terms of targets. But of course, the problem with option one is that on analysis, the 200 metre standard was found to be without any proper foundation and did not allow for simple variations, such as the distance over which the missiles travelled. So it was plucked out of the air as a standard and then it was applied without variation as to the circumstances. For that reason, not only did all five judges in the ICTY appeal chamber rule that it was evidentially groundless, but even the ICTY prosecutor by the appeal stage had abandoned reliance on it. And that no doubt is why the respondent has not invited you to go back to the 200 metre standard. No one in their right mind would go back to that standard which has been so heavily criticised by everybody who's looked at it subsequently. But if not the abandoned 200 metre standard, then what? Option two, the only other option left to this court is your own assessment on some other basis. But what evidence has the respondent put before you to advance its case that the artillery attacks were unlawful? To show that the targets were not legitimate, some standard or yardstick is surely needed to distinguish between legitimate and indiscriminate artillery attacks. That distinction has got to be made if the proposition that they are unlawful on the basis put is to be sustained. So where is the standard, where's the yardstick, and where's a suitably qualified expert faithfully applying the chosen yardstick to the facts of this case? Non-existent. No standard, no yardstick, no expert. So in summary, the appeal chamber in Gotovina doesn't help the respondent, and they urge you not to follow it, not to treat it highly persuasive because that ends their case. So the appeal chamber doesn't help. The first instance chamber doesn't help because they relied on the flawed 200 metre standard. So you can't go back to that. And the only other option is some standard of your own, which you're going to apply to the facts without any help as to what the standard is or any expert that takes you through the facts to give you findings that can be meaningful to determine whether the uh, targets were legitimate or indiscriminate. How can the respondent possibly get home on unlawful artillery attacks uh, when they are the only options but none of them help the respondent? The simple fact of the matter is this, Gotovina or not, the respondent ran this case on a proposition 
namely that the artillery attacks were unlawful because they were indiscriminate, which is wholly unsupported on its own evidence. It's all very well inviting this court to make its own assessment, but on what basis? And I reflected on that over the weekend. Mr. President, members of the court, the dawning reality is this. The hypothetical to which Professor Shabus devoted so much time in closing is not a hypothetical at all. It is now the respondent's case. They are so far from their original case that it is impossible to bridge the gap back home. That explains the considerable time and energy spent on the hypothetical, which, on any view, is a curious way to end a case such as this. So let us examine the hypothetical again. You still have it, I hope, on your screens. The points I make in response are so obvious that I did wonder about the wisdom of making them at all. First, for the respondent to end its case relying on a hypothetical is hardly a show of strength in the arguments once made, but now all but abandoned. Second, it, even on its own terms, just reading the words on the screen carefully, the highest the respondent puts it is that those who schemed at Bryony may have concluded that lawful shelling would be enough to affect the removal of the Serbs. So they were conspiring by lawful means to commit genocide. It's not an obvious proposition. I, I pause there. This sinister intent has apparently been hidden so deeply that it was missed by the prosecutor. The prosecutor, before the ICTY, relied on unlawful shelling. It was missed by the prosecutor. It was missed by the ICTY at first instance. They relied on unlawful shelling. And it was missed by the appeal chamber because they were analysing unlawful shelling. And it's been missed by every commentator. It was only unearthed by Professor Shabus last Friday 18 years and 8 months after the Bryony meeting. Nobody else before then has suggested that you can commit suicide, uh, c commit genocide um, by um, lawful shelling. That is the complete contrary of the way the case um, had been put. Uh, and just staying with the words on the page, those who schemed may have concluded that lawful shelling would be enough. That's not even proof on the balance of probabilities. I described it as flying a kite. This is flying a kite. If all else fails, which it now has at this stage, try this as an idea. Third, um, the whole hypothetical is now based on some unarticulated idea that even if the attacks were not indiscriminate or carried out with the intention to displace the Serbs, that they were unlawful in some other way. Well, what other way? A and on what evidence? If the shelling was not indiscriminate, the basis upon which everybody has proceeded to date, what's the alternative basis for unlawfulness? And why was it never articulated in the pleadings? The Bryony minutes don't help. The respondent ended its case on Friday accepting, and I quote, taken in isolation, the Bryony minutes may indeed lend themselves to different interpretations. Indeed. But how do artillery attacks which are not unlawful help the respondent's preferred interpretation? Alternatively, how do minutes, capable even on the respondent's case of bearing a number of interpretations, show that artillery attacks found by the appeals chamber not to have been indiscriminate were otherwise unlawful. One unsustainable proposition 
does not gain strength by being linked to another unsustainable proposition. To observe that the respondent's case is hopelessly circular is to state the obvious. Mr. President, members of court, let us examine whether the respondent's case on targeting civilians in the columns breaks the circle. The respondent claims that the Bryony Minute should be viewed in light of the subsequent alleged targeting of the columns. The applicant responded to this allegation on the 18th of March this year, and the respondent has offered nothing new in rebuttal. Croatia did not target civilians in the column. No plan to do so was discussed at Bryony, and the ICTY made no findings to this effect. Against that background, Professor Schaber suggested that this court should infer that Tushman was targeting civilians at Bryony when he insisted that an escape route should be left to the retreating forces in order to minimise the losses that would have been occasioned by a desperate fight to the death. Anyone who has read Sun Tzu's The Art of War would realise that leaving a way out to a surrounded enemy is one of the most ancient and uncontroversial humanitarian restrictions on warfare. It's certainly not a basis for inferring genocide. But there's an equally profound problem for the respondent on the facts. Although the respondent has not exercised any particular care in the way it's put its case in the oral pleadings, in its written pleadings, it relied on four alleged attacks on columns in the territory known as Sector North, and a fifth in Bosnia-Herzegovina, near Petrovac. So five attacks, four in Sector North. That's their case at its highest, that now is said to give rise to genocidal intent. Last Friday, Professor Shabers told you that, and I quote, as the events that took place during Operation Storm suggest, the refugee columns were deliberately ambushed, shelled, and executed by the Croatian soldiers on the way. So deliberate ambushing, shelling on the way. Four of the five attacks in Sector North. Yet, when he opened the case before this court, Mr. Obradovic was at pains to point out that the Croatian army commander in Sector North, General Stepetic, did not have any genocidal mens rea. He emphasised that point. The only individual he singled out in that way. So the respondent is inviting you to come to a finding of genocide on the basis of four attacks in Sector North, whilst itself disavowing mens rea on the part of the man in charge. That again is a curious way to end your case. Professor Shabas next claimed that the Bryony Minute should be given a criminal interpretation in light of the killings that took place in the weeks and months after the storm. He made no attempt to explain how this argument is sustainable in light of the fact that um, murder and looting were not discussed at Bryony and in light of the ICTY trial chamber's explicit finding that the Bryony participants had no intention to commit murder, destruction or plunder. Anticipate that he would invite you um, to take a different approach to the ICTY at first instance. And I won't repeat the submissions on that. Professor Shabas claimed that most of the Serbs that stayed behind were killed. That, and then this is how he put it, all of the Serbs who were found in the cities and villages in August 1995 were killed by the Croatian army. All the Serbs. And that the Croatian soldiers killed as many civilians as they were able to find or to lure out of hiding. And then... All surviving Serbs in Kraina, to the extent that the Cro Croat forces could find them, were exterminated. That's what you were told on Friday. The facts are as follows. First, the numbers. On the 21st of December 1995, the UN Secretary General reported that according to the ICRC, there were slightly more than 9,000 Serbs in the former UN sectors north and south. For his part, 
Mr Sturbach, the respondent's expert witness, claims that 1,662 persons were allegedly killed by Croatian forces during Operation Storm, total 1,662, of whom 1,513 were killed during the first week. So on the respondent's case at its very highest, 149 people regrettably lost their life after the first week of the operation. 149 out of 9,000. Second, the Gotovina trial chamber cited evidence that 4,000 civilians who were found by the Croatian army in the Kraina region were taken to government-run reception centres to be cared for, 4,000. And 400 captured Serb combatants were taken to collection centres and processed through the criminal justice system. Pausing there and just looking again at the screen, 4,000 were taken to a government-run reception centre and 400 combatants were put through the criminal justice system. Look again at those three sweeping quotes from Professor Shavers. All surviving Serbs in the Kraina, to the extent the Croat forces could find them, were exterminated. How can that be right? Lest there be any suspicion that civilians were taken to the reception centres for some nefarious purpose, we urge the court to note that the trial chamber concluded that civilians were free to leave the reception centres at any time and that they were not deprived of their liberty, an issue in the case. Mr Jordash also tried to support this claim of an organised killing campaign by claiming that there was a pattern of concealment by the Croatian army because of alleged restrictions on movement by the UN personnel, on the movement by UN personnel. What Mr Jordash admitted to advise this court is that the ICTY trial chamber expressly rejected the claim of a pattern of concealment Finding, and I quote, the trial chamber further considers that concealment of crimes is not the only reasonable interpretation of the general evidence regarding movement restrictions. So again, raised in the ICTY at first instance, dealt with by that chamber, and not accepted. Mr President, members of the court, the respondents' claims of an organised killing campaign designed to exterminate the Kraina Serbs lacks any basis in evidence or reality. The respondent further claimed that the applicant ignored the respondent's allegations of acts causing serious bodily and mental harm to members of the group of Krayan Serbs. That's actually wrong. The applicant has repeatedly noted the Gotovina trial chamber's specific findings that the Croatian leadership, including President Tuzman, not only did not intend this destruction, but that they were opposed to it. The respondents' reliance on reports of the ECMM and the UN military observers concerning the number of burned houses after Operation Storm is equally misplaced. The ICTY had all of this evidence before it, including the documents the respondent claims support its case. The trial chamber did not accept them. Finally, and in any event, however distressing, looting and burning of property is, and of course it is. It is not, of course, an act that can of itself constitute genocide within the meaning of Article 2 of the Convention. So, Mr President, members of the Court, in conclusion, my submissions make clear that the respondent's counterclaim based on alleged violations of the Genocide Convention during and after Operation Storm cannot succeed on the facts and evidence presented. Neither the Bryony transcripts nor the events that follow it establish genocidal intent. In addition, uh, there is not sufficient evidence in respect of those events for this court to be fully convinced that genocidal acts have, have occurred. On a final issue of evidence, we note that the respondent's earlier enthusiasm for the discredited CHC report and Veritas has somewhat diminished after our comprehensive exposure of their deficiencies last week. Serbia ended its case, half-heartedly stating that the CHC report has not been completely discredited by the ICTY and acknowledges that the Veritas report contained factual errors, hardly ending on a high. 
Mr. President, members of the court, thank you for your attention today uh, and in my previous submissions. Can I now invite you to call on Professor Sands, uh, who will deal with the legal issues. Thank you, Sakia Starmer. I now, now call on Professor Philip Sands to continue. You have the floor, sir. Mr. President, members of the court, um, forced to me to respond to the legal arguments, such as they were, that the respondent made in support of its counterclaim last Friday afternoon. The court will have noted, certainly as did our side of the room, that those arguments were thin and somewhat novel. Mr. President, members of the court, having devoted more than half of its opening round to the counterclaim, the respondent devoted far less time to the counterclaim in its second round, and Serbia plainly appears to recognize that its claim is, as we put it in the first round, hopeless. It is without any legal authority. Professor Shabas and Mr. Jordish hardly advanced a positive legal case. The events over four days in August 1995 amounted to a genocide. Following the Gotovina judgments, and I use the term in the plural, it's difficult to see how it could do otherwise. Professor Shabas was rather defensive in his tone. In opening, he announced that he would address what he called the limited relevance of the Gotovina decision. Yet, his first 25 footnotes were all Gotovina. Indeed, his speech comprised 112 footnotes, of which 40, 40 made reference to judicial authorities. Of those 40, 38 referred to Gotovina. He made a single reference to this court's 2007 judgment, which he and Serbia obviously do not consider to be helpful to their counterclaim, and a single reference to another judgment of the ICTY, the Perlich case, which was to, fi to a finding of fact, not of law. Despite the fact that he urged this court to find that there was, as he put it, essential differences between the Gotovina case before the ICTY and the subject matter of the counterclaim, the only case he dwelt on was Gotovina. He complained about what he called a gaping hole in the picture presented by the ICTY case law. Mr. President, if there is a gaping hole, then it is in the respondent's counterclaim. It is customary in advancing one's case to cite to legal authorities that are supportive of the propositions one makes. Professor Shabas was unable to invoke a single legal authority to support Serbia's counterclaim last Friday afternoon. The respondent is plainly aware that the ICTY's judgments in the Gotovina case are fatal to its counterclaim. It has chosen not to address at all the trial chamber's findings concerning the lack of intent by Croatia's leaders to kill or injure Serbs or to destroy their property. Last Friday, Professor Shabas abandoned completely any continued attempt to argue that the shelling in Operation Storm was unlawful or that it targeted civilians. But he chose instead to advance a new theory for the counterclaim, theory which is in our submission nonsensical as a matter of law and totally undermined by the highly persuasive findings of fact and law of the trial and appeal cham chambers in Gotovina. In a somewhat novel approach, he now rests his case on the argument that this court should find, as a matter of law, that the artillery bombardment of the four towns were genocidal in character, notwithstanding a hypothesis, and I hesitate to use that word, Mr. President, following the court's judgment yesterday, that the bombardment was, as he put it, entirely consistent with the laws or customs of war and in compliance with the law of armed conflict. 
he posited that even were one to assume, as the ICTY appeals chamber held, that only military targets, objectives were targeted and that the choice of weapons was proportionate, aimed at minimizing collateral damage in particular towards non-combatants, this court might somehow nevertheless be able to rule that the shelling was genocidal. You are asked as a court to find that the Bryony Minutes evidence is the mens rea of genocide regardless of the means and regardless of the lawfulness of the means that the Croatian leadership chose to employ to regain control of Croatian territory. On that logic, if it can be called logic, you are asked to believe and to find that the lawful shelling by the Croatian army during Operation Storm or more specifically perhaps the great fear inspired by that lawful shelling in those present in the four towns constituted the actus reus of genocide. Professor Shabbos goes so far as to assert, I quote, that he does not think this is a difficult proposition. Mr. President, members of the court, it is not a difficult proposition. It is a hopeless proposition. It is legally and logically impossible as a proposition. It's also an extraordinary proposition for Professor Shabbos to attempt to advance before this court. How can an attack that complies with international humanitarian law be genocidal in nature? It surely cannot constitute the actus reus of genocide. How could an attack be genocidal and yet comply with the laws of war? It's a looking glass proposition an attack that is both lawful and genocidal, a notion as contradictory and nonsensical as it sounds. This argument is also plainly at odds with the findings of the ICTY in Gotovina. Even in relation to the trial chamber's limited factual findings that were overturned by the appeal chamber, namely its finding that the shelling of the four towns was indiscriminate based on the 200 metre standard, the trial chamber repeatedly found the Croatian army's targeting of military objectives to have been, and I quote, in good faith. Targeting of military objectives for the purpose of expelling civilians, much less for the purpose of destroying an ethnic group in whole or in part, can never be conducted in good faith. These findings further and fatally undermine Professor Shabbos's argument that lawful shelling was the actus reus of genocide. In the face of those findings, all Professor Shabbos can do is to boldly assert that the ICTY appeals chamber is wrong. The respondent's recourse once again is to deny unhelpful ICTY findings and to ask this court to go behind them. Instead of a search for authorities, what we heard instead were unfortunate and highly personalized, unjustifiable attacks on the former president of Croatia argument by ad hominem assertion, which is unusual for any court of law, let alone this one. There was an expression of surprise that somehow Croatia had not leapt to President Tudjman's defense. But the nature of those arguments, if they can be called arguments, speaks for themselves. It was unbecoming in our submission for a sovereign state to associate itself with such assertions and they are undeserving of a response in a courtroom. Perhaps this was one element of the speech inserted, as Professor Shabbos candidly put it, and I quote, because the agent for Serbia asked me to do this, end of quote. Equally unhappy was Professor Shabbos's return to the events of January 1942. It may be that a retraction of sorts was made, clumsy and inappropriate, his words might be said to be words of understatement. But perhaps we were not alone in feeling discomforted by the impression that what counsel gave with one hand, he then took away with the other, with most unfortunate references to, and I quote, Tudjman's final solution, end of quote, and Lebensraum. Sir Keith Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer has said more than enough about the Bryony Minutes, and so has the ICTY. What about Mr. Jordash and legal authorities? 
He made one reference to your 2007 judgment last Friday afternoon and several references to the Gotovina judgment and not a single reference to any other ICTY judgment. Even in dealing with the nine points of comparison that Croatia made and on which we respectfully submit he made not a dent, as Sakir has shown, in respect of the section entitled ICTY findings, point eight of the nine, he was unable to bring himself to refer to a single judgment other than a relevant passing reference to the Martic case to support the case he advanced. In short, the counterclaim made by Serbia is bereft of any, any supportive legal authority. Let me turn to something briefly about missing persons and the issue of continuing violation, as Serbia has addressed this issue in its counterclaim. Counsel for the respondent claimed that the continuing violation argument was, as he put it, nothing more than an ill-conceived debating ploy cooked up over breakfast. Actually, it was a response to a question put by Judge Cansado Trindade. Croatia addressed the issue of continuing violations in a manner that was intended to be responsive and helpful to an inquiry from the bench. It's true that neither party had addressed that issue very extensively in its pleadings. But the questions having been put and the provisions of the Convention speaking in terms that it does, I refer you to Article 2, Paragraph B, which refers to serious mental harm to members of the group, the connection with a continuing violation became rather clear. It does not belong here, counsel for Serbia said. But why not? Just as with torture, the family of the missing person is a member of the same group, is subject to a continuing mental harm, and it is equally the situation that the failure to account for a missing person or to take reasonable steps to assist in the location of such a person brings into play the prohibition on acts prescribed by the Genocide Convention, including the obligation to investigate. Serbia, too, sought to respond to the questions put on missing persons that came from the bench, and it offered a new list of missing persons. The document was not sourced and came with no proper accompanying explanation. Since the agent of Serbia told the court that he did not, and I quote, consider that list to be evidence, end of quote, nothing more need be said of it. Mr. President, I turn to the issue of inferring intent to destroy a group in whole or in part from a pattern of behavior, a proposition raised by Professor Shabas in the counterclaim, as you've just heard from Sakir Starmer. We might call this the paragraph 373 issue. You will, of course, recall that I'd made the submission on Thursday, the 20th of March, to the effect that no international court or tribunal had applied the very high burden set out in paragraph 373 or had followed the language adopted by this court seven years ago. I also made the point that some made clear some courts and tribunals made clear that they did not consider themselves to be bound by the approach that is said to have been followed by this court in 2007. In response to that proposition, Professor Shabas claimed that despite extensive legal research, he could not find any instance of any court or tribunal saying it was not bound by the ICJ approach. We were a bit puzzled by his submission, baffled even, because Professor Shabbas himself expressly referred to such instances in his speech on the 10th of March 2014. The examples he cited are manifold. For example, in June 2012, the trial chamber in Karajit, in its Rule 98 biz decision, reinstating a genocide charge, stated that the ICJ's 2007 judgment is, and I quote, not binding in any way on the chamber, end of quote. Professor Shabas explicitly referred to this ruling in his speech, but a week after he'd done so, it seems he'd forgotten all about that. I would note, in parentheses, 
but there seems to be quite a lot that Professor Shabus chooses to forget. Last week, he told you that your 2007 judgment has provided, and I quote, clarity and stability, end of quote. Well, that's not what he said two years ago. Two years ago, he described the approach taken by this court in its 2007 judgment as, and I quote, incoherent, end of quote, because it rejected the genocide qualification for most of the conflict in Bosnia, yet it applied, applied it to one terrible event during the war that was of short duration and isolated in a geographic sense. They're in the dangers of writing blogs. Four years before that, in 2008, a year after your judgment, he submitted an expert opinion to the ICTY in the Popovich case. What did he say in that expert opinion about the 2007 judgment? He did not welcome it. He did not say it provided clarity and stability. What he said was that your judgment compels a reassessment of the law on genocidal intent. Be that as it may, in July 2013, the ICTY appeals chamber in the Karadzic case, on the same point as the trial chamber, stated that it was, and I quote, not bound by legal determinations reached by the ICJ. Professor Shabbas again seems to have forgotten that he told you in his speech on Monday 10th of March that the trial chamber began by stating that it was not bound either by earlier findings during trials before the tribunal or by the judgment of the ICJ of February 2007. The ICTY is not alone in distancing itself from the 2007 judgment in relation to intent. The ICTR has done the same thing. In Hategeki Mana, the ICTR appeals chamber did not explicitly state that it is not bound by the ICJ judgment, but this problem is a necessary implication from the text of the judgment and the standard that it did apply. The appeals chamber referred to the test for inferring genocidal intent in the absence of direct evidence as follows, and I quote, a perpetrator's intent to commit genocide may be inferred from relevant facts and circumstances, including the general context of the perpetration of other culpable acts systematically directed against the same group, the scale of atrocities committed, the systematic targeting of victims on account of their membership in a particular group, or the repetition of destructive and discriminatory acts. The appeals chamber in that case cited authority in support from the ICTY and the ICTR. It did not cite the Bosnia judgment of 2007 nor did it refer to the requirement for genocidal intent to be the only possible inference. It's plain from this, as I've already noted, that the ICTR appeals chamber did not proceed on the basis that it was bound by the ICJ's approach to inference of genocidal intent as expressed at paragraph 373 of the Bosnia judgment. So Professor Shabas offered us another gentle meander through the case law. We waited, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited for him to take us to any judgment or any decision of any court or tribunal, national or international, that had invoked paragraph 373 or the standard there set out, and it never came. As far as we are aware, there is no such case. So, Professor Shabas tried a different tack in seeking to argue that this court's approach has been very generally accepted on that issue, notwithstanding the absence of any supportive authorities, he said there was no difference between the, what the court said at paragraph 373 and what various ICTY tribunals have done in practice. To make that point, he took you to a passage of the judgment in the Ptolemy case, paragraph 745 in which the trial chamber stated that, and I quote, indications of such intent are rarely overt, however, and thus it is permissible to infer the existence of genocidal intent based on all of the evidence taken together, as long as this inference is the only reasonable one available on the evidence. He said there was no difference between the two standards. 
and I quote him, the trial chamber in Ptolemyr did not cite the relevant statement by the ICJ, notably paragraph 373 of the 2007 judgment, but it might well have done so. Well, let's compare the two approaches on the screen. At the top, you can see in English and in French what this court ruled in 2007. For a pattern of conduct to be accepted as evidence of its existence, it would have to be such that it could only point to the existence of such intent. And then below, coming up on the screen now, we can see what the ICTY trial chamber said in Ptolemy in 2012, and I'll read it again. It is permissible to infer the existence of genocidal intent based on all of the evidence taken together, as long as this inference is the only reasonable one available on the evidence. If I was in a classroom, which I am not, I might turn to my students and say, if I was a devotee of a hardline Socratic method, is there a difference between the two standards? Well, one or two of the students might say, no, Professor, we can't see any difference between those two standards. And I turn around the room and I might say, is there anyone here who doesn't agree with that view? Some may eventually put their hands up and say, well, it's true that there are similarities between the two. Both formulations, for example, do use the word only. And that's obviously correct. I might then ask, is there anything to be found in the 2012 Ptolemy standard that is not to be found in the 2007 ICJ standard? If classes of this year and others are anything to go by, there may be a long initial silence as the two texts were carefully looked at and eventually some hands would come up around the room and one student might say in the front row or on the far left or wherever, well, actually, yes, there is a difference between the two standards, and the difference is this. In Ptolemy, you find the word reasonable, and in Bosnia, you do not, and that is obviously correct. And that's the nub of this. What Professor Shabas is asking you to do is to conclude that the use of the word reasonable is irrelevant. Parentheses, I would note, having sat in this courtroom yesterday, that word got quite a lot of play. But Professor Shabas's approach is wrong. The standard of proof in criminal matters before the ICTY, the ICTR, the ICC, as well as many national legal systems, is not a standard of beyond doubt. It is a standard of beyond reasonable doubt. The word reasonable is not without importance. And that, in simple terms, is a difference, and it is a material difference. Indeed, Professor Shabbas himself accepts that. When he invited this court to review de novo the Bryony Minutes, he did not ask you to conclude that there was no doubt that those minutes reflected a desire to impose a final solution, as he so unhappily put it. No, he did not do that. No, he did not. He invited you to conclude that there was no reasonable doubt. We say, of course, that you cannot so conclude. But the point I make now is a different one. Council for Serbia accepts that there is a world of difference between no doubt on the one hand and no reasonable doubt on the other. Mr. President, we're not asking you to change the law, to rip it up, abandon it, as Serbia claims. We're not asking the court, certainly, to perform an act of legal vandalism, as Mr. Jordesh bluntly suggested. We are simply asking for a clarification of the standard in paragraph 373 to bring it in line with the standard that appears to be applied everywhere else. For the purposes of the counterclaim made by Serbia, their case is hopeless, whichever standard you apply whether it is the one they say is reflected in paragraph 373 or the one that we say might have been intended to have been reflected in paragraph 373, namely the court's ordinary approach to conclusive 
evidence. The standard the court has adopted is that it must be fully convinced that the crime of genocide has been committed and that the acts are attributable to the respondent. The same standard applies to the proof of special intent or dollar specialis in establishing genocide. The applicant submits that the standard of proof required to prove genocidal intent will be met where there may be other possible explanations for a pattern of conduct and indeed there will almost certainly be various other motives and intentions even behind a pattern of conduct but nonetheless the court is fully convinced on the facts of the particular case including the destructive methods exhibited by that pattern that the only reasonable inference properly to be drawn is one of genocidal intent which brings me to Jepa a small town in Bosnia and Herzegovina which was the subject of that part of the Ptolemy judgment that Professor Shabas did not address in the first round. The ICTY trial chamber did there find that the only reasonable inference was one of genocidal intent. It did so in circumstances where just three individuals were killed. I say just, it is regrettable of course that any were killed, but the number is not a large number. On Friday morning, Professor Shabas told the court in his address on Actus Reis that to make the killing of a small number of individuals capable of constituting genocide, and he mentioned a figure of two, would make the definition of genocide in Article 2 of the Convention very simplistic and profoundly unworkable. Well, that's not what the ICTY trial chamber found. On Friday afternoon, he did finally turn to the judgment of the ICTY trial chamber in Ptolemyr that related to the Jepa situation, the very last moment of the entire case. It is a case they would rather you did not turn your minds to, which ruled, of course, that the killing of just three people constituted the mens rea and the actus reus of genocide. A dramatic departure, he called it, from the 2007 judgment of this court. That's a concession. Three people can be a significant part of the group, he conceded. An alternative to the criterion of substantiality, he conceded, which brings him in line with the submissions we made in our first round on exactly this point where I started nearly a month ago. Where does this leave us, Mr. President and members of the court? The respondents counterclaim to succeed it would need to produce direct evidence of a genocidal plan. It has no such evidence. The ICTY has conclusively determined that the Bryony Minutes are not evidence of unlawfulness and the respondent has widely stepped away, wisely stepped away from its attempt to treat those minutes as being no different from the minutes of the Vanze Conference. Or evidence of a pattern of attack and or evidence of a pattern of attack from which genocidal intent could be inferred. It has simply not done so in respect of the counterclaim. Despite Mr. Jordash and his hysteric, her heroic attempts to mimic the clear pattern of attack adopted by Serbia in its campaign against Croatia, which does evidence genocidal intent, the respondent has failed to present any evidence on a pattern much less any pattern from which genocidal intent could be inferred. There is a curious parallel between the respondent's counterclaim and its defence to Croatia's claim. In both cases, on the law, it seeks to deny the relevance and authority of final, unappealable ICTY findings. With respect to the claim, they argue that the appellate judgments in Merchitz, Martic and Babic are put least probative, whereas trial chamber judgments in Stanisic and Simatovic are the most relevant. There's also a contradiction on the Serbian side. In its counterclaim, it seeks to persuade you of the merits of a first instance ICTY trial chamber decision, Gotovina, for example, or Stanisic. But in defending itself against Croatia's claim, it seeks to diminish 
the merits of a first instance ICTY trial chamber decision in Tolimere. This might be called a rather a la carte approach to authorities, but it is not one that can repair the fatal weaknesses of Serbia's counterclaim. Mr. President, members of the court, I thank you once again for your kind attention. That completes my presentation this morning, and I invite you to call to the, agent, to the bar to our final presentation this morning, the agent of Croatia. Thank you, Mr. Sands, and I now call on the agent of the government of Croatia, in this case, Professor Vesna srenic grotic You have the floor, madam. Thank you. Mr. President, member of, of the court, it is a pleasure to address you once again on this final day of hearings in which Croatia responds to issues raised by the respondent on its counterclaim last week. In fact, the counterclaim was submitted only after the jurisdiction judgment was delivered by the court. In the words of the then Serbian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeremic, it was a technical counterclaim. Mr. Tibo Varadi, former agent for the respondent in this case, explicitly said that there had been no genocide in Croatia against the Serbs. Mr. Radoslav Stojanovic, former agent for the respondent in the Bosnia case, warned the authorities how futile the counterclaim was. Moreover, even Mr. Obradovic explained in 2010 that they had to submit the counterclaim in order to assume the role of plaintiff in these proceedings. It seems that even today he does not believe that the counterclaim is credible. Yet, despite these well-informed views, the counterclaim was brought to this court. In these oral proceedings, the respondent has been trying to convince the court that Croatia brought its claim as an attempt to paralyze cases against Croatians before the ICTY. Mr. President, Croatia's claim has been pending for 13 years since the ICTY asserted jurisdiction over Croatian cases. So any assertion that Croatia has maintained this case for improper reasons is plainly wrong. There is only one reason for the claim, to establish the respondent's respons responsibility for the genocide committed against Croatians. Last week, the respondent told us again the same story and repeated the same arguments. The respondent produced a new list of people missing on the territory of Croatia in response to Judge Consada's question. It was submitted in the Cyrillic script, so not in one of the official languages of the court. The list sets out 1,747 people as missing. So is it really necessary to invent new lists every time the question of the number of Serbian victims is raised. The manipulations with numbers have to stop. The book of the missing on the territory of Croatia from 2012, submitted by Croatia to the court two weeks ago, is an authoritative publication on persons missing from the territory of Croatia, including both Croats and Serbs. The data contained in this book has been consolidated through cooperation with the Croatian Red Cross Tracing Service and the administration of the detained and missing persons of the Croatian Ministry of Veterans and cross-checked by the International Committee of the Red Cross, the Red Cross of Serbia and the Commission for Missing Persons of Serbia. And thus, this edition is the result of a joint effort of all these stakeholders. It contains the names of all people who were last seen on Croatian territory and who are still missing, and it is the authoritative source for the numbers of the missing in Croatia. We emphasize that the number of 865 missing provided orally to the court related only to those who disappeared in 1991, 1992, 
and who are still missing. The current overall number of missing persons, accurate as of the 31st of December last year, was 1,663. This includes all those who were reported missing on the territory of Croatia from 1991 to 1995, including Croats, Serbs, and people of other ethnicities and nationalities. Last Thursday and Friday, you heard a series of unfounded, inflammatory allegations against the Republic of Croatia. It is an indisputable fact that for many years during and after the wars of the 1990s, many in Serbia denied that Serbians committed crimes at all during the course of the conflict, as well as denied that they had committed crimes of the scale that occurred. Thus, it was common in Serbia to argue that the Srebrenica massacre was a myth conquered by foreign intelligence services, or that Vukovar was liberated by Serb forces in 1991, or that the massacres of civilians in the shellings of Sarajevo was nothing but a staged production to demonize the Serbs. You have heard some echoes of this in this court. With the work of the ICTY, however, these denials became less and less plausible. So within the past five to ten years, Serbia has adopted a new approach. It no longer denies that crimes were committed, but instead argues that all sides suffer in war and all sides commit crimes in war. That's what we heard in this courtroom as well. We are told that no one has clean hands from the breakup of Yugoslavia, and therefore you should simply condemn everyone with the same broad brush, rather than singling, singling out Serbian leadership. It is an appealing proposition to the uninformed observer, but it is not based on any facts. Mr. President, members of the court, Serbia and its satellites in Croatia committed crimes, including genocidal crimes, as a matter of deliberate governmental policy to achieve the political goal of an ethnically pure Greater Serbia. As we have explained during these proceedings, Croatia had no criminal policies towards Serbs at any point in the wars of the 1990s a point confirmed by the work of the ICTY. We are not all the same, despite the respondent's protest to the contrary. The respondent's counterclaim will not succeed in masking Serbia's responsibility for its criminal policies. Pursuing the strategy of equalization of guilt on Thursday, Mr. Jordan told you that this was a complex war with a multitude of actors and a myriad of intentions. We were told Tujman wanted and provoked this terrible ethnic war. Finally, Mr. George told us that Croatia's perspective is one-dimensional and is a caricatured tale of the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia and the genesis of the violence that begins with the James Bond villain in the guise of Milosevic. He asserted that the problem, of course, with this account is that the applicant removes every trace of Tujman's poisonous regime. One needs to look no further than the findings of the ICTY to determine the accurate account as to the root causes of the conflict. <laughs> Professor Shabas told this court that the ICTY is a specialized court set up to specifically investigate the events in the wars of the former Yugoslavia, and that the ICTY is, and I quote, familiar with the details in, in a way that, with respect, is beyond the reach of the limited inquiry taken here by this court, end of quote. So after 21 years, what does the work of the ICTY tell us? 
With respect to the conflict between Croatia and Serbia that occurred in 1991 and 1992, the ICTY prosecutor did not indict a single Croatian, nor did it find any JCE in relation to the conflict in Croatia involving any Croat, living or dead, including President Tuđman. In contrast, on the Serbian side, the ICTY indicted and convicted a number of Serbian political and military leaders for the events in 1991 in Croatia. Many were found to have participated in the JCE, so this speaks volumes about the nature of the conflict in Croatia in 1991 and 1992, despite the respondents' protestations to the contrary. Scholars also disagree with what Mr. Jordash claimed, that President Tuđman was responsible for provoking the conflict. One such scholar who assists, assists Croatia on this point is Professor Shabas himself, who co-authored the book with Michael Scharf in 2002, entitled Slobodan Milosevic on Trial, a Companion. You might say that Professor Shabas' own book portrays Milosevic as a James Bond villain, although the villain in Professor Shabas' book was all too real for his victims across the former Yugoslavia. Professor Shabas informs us in the book that the root of the conflict lay in the 1986 Sano Memorandum, which, and I quote, became the manifesto of the Serb nationalist movement, end of quote. And, I quote, paved the way for Slobodan Milosevic's rise to power, end of quote. According to Professor Shabas, from September 23, 1987, and I quote, Milosevic, with the counsel of his wife, whipped Serbia into a nationalist frenzy that ultimately contributed to the disintegration of Yugoslavia and the economic and physical destruction of Serbia. After succeeding Stambolic as president of Serbia in 1989, Milosevic employed nationalist sentiment to wage war on the independence-minded republics. End of quote. And as you can see, all exactly as our expert witness, Ms. Sonia Biserko, explained to you. Professor Shabas then expressly states that Milosevic started the war when he personally sent the JNA first into Slovenia and then into Croatia in the summer of 1991. As for Croatia's president, Professor Shabas writes that it was the rise of the hardline nationalist government in Serbia that provoked anti-Serb nationalism in Slovenia and Croatia, and not the other way around, as the respondent would have it in this court. Rather than portraying President Tuđman as a warmonger, Professor Shabas writes that the presidents of Croatia and Slovenia, and I quote, sought to convert Yugoslavia into a loose confederation where Serbian influence would be diluted." End of quote. The ICTY's work is highly persuasive evidence that Croatia's arguments are correct and Serbia's are nothing more than a tactical diversion from Serbia's responsibility. The views of Milosevic by Professor Shabas, version 2002, also find support in the work of the ICTY. The views espoused last week by Mr. Jordash and Professor Shabas, version 2014, find support only in the Serbian nationalist myth. Let me also note that the ICTY did not convict a single Croatian concerning the war in Croatia from 1991 to 1995. This is no mistake. While there is no doubt 
that individual crimes were perpetrated by Croatians against Serb civilians, these crimes did not occur as part of any state policy. The court will recall that in its first round, response to the respondent's counterclaim, Croatia emphasized the Gotovina trial chamber's unanimous findings, not appealed by the prosecutor, that President Tujman and the Croatian leadership did not intend to murder Serbs, inflict cruel or inhuman treatment on Serbs, or destroy the property of Serbs. We also noted that the trial chamber found that it could not find a general policy of non-investigation of crimes against Serbs, and that the parties in the Gotovina case all agreed that the Croatian authorities had issued effective orders to protect Serbian churches and religious monuments. The task for the respondent's legal team is in round two was to explain to the court how these highly persuasive findings could possibly be consistent with the respondent's claim that the Croatian leadership harbored genocidal intent towards the Krajina Serbs in Operation Storm. Can leaders who do not intend to kill or injure or destroy and who protect religious institutions of an ethnic group nevertheless harbor genocidal intent towards that group? Of course not. Perhaps this is why the respondent's legal team chose to ignore these trial chamber findings entirely. The closest they came to addressing these undisputed findings of the Gotovina trial chamber was Mr. Georgesh's comment made in passing that Serbia, and I quote, must live with the controversy of the Gotovina judgment. However, there is absolutely nothing controversial about these findings. The Gotovina trial chamber delivered them unanimously. They were not appealed by the prosecutor, and therefore these findings were not even in dispute during the proceedings before the appeals chamber. How the respondent reconciles the unanimous ICTY view that President Tujman and the Croatian leadership did not intend to kill or injure Serbs or destroy their property with the respondent's claim that President Tujman and the Croatian leadership intended to destroy the crime of Serbs in whole or in part is a mystery and a mystery unaddressed by Serbia in its second round. Croatia submits that the respondent's silence on this fundamental point is effectively a concession by Serbia that its counterclaim has no merit at all. Croatia has always believed that its role in these oral proceedings is to assist the court in its effort to resolve the legal issues in dispute between the parties. To that end, we have avoided discussions about oblique matters that only distract from the real issues. Unfortunately, our colleagues on the other side have not done the same. Rather than providing useful assistance to the court, like, for instance, explaining why the respondent believes the Gotovina trial chamber's findings are not fatal to the respondent's counterclaim, the respondent generally and Professor Schaeber specifically have used inflammatory rhetoric in an effort to play to the Serbian audience back home. For Professor Schaeber to lay his speech with loaded words like Lebensraum, Wannsee, final solution, while simultaneously being unable to deal with the Gotovina trial chamber's findings on the lawful intent of the Croatian leadership was telling. Moreover, Professor Sheba seems eager to draw Croatia into a debate about President Franjo Tuđman. To set the record straight, President Tuđman was a distinguished partisan fighter in World War II. 
When he attended the 50th anniversary of the Allied victory in Europe in World War II on the 8th of May in 1995 in London, just days after Operation Flash, he was the only participating head of state who had actually fought in the defense of Europe against the scourge of Nazi fascism. His resolve to base Croatia on an anti-fascist foundation is visible in the preamble of the Croatian constitution adopted in 1990. As for his conduct during the war in Croatia, the ICTY record speaks for itself. Concerning Operation Storm, President Tuzman was vindicated by both the trial and appeals chamber judgment in Gotovina. The respondent nevertheless wants to draw Croatia into a debate about President Tuzman, but the ICTY's findings and the respondent's complete inability to address them ended such debate well before these proceedings even began. Let me repeat that Operation Storm was the operation that put an end to the criminal enterprise of the RSK. It marked the beginning of the political end for those responsible for the crimes in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, many of whom were subsequently convicted by the ICTY. Operation Storm was the last resort for Croatia facing the constant and well-documented refusal by the, R by the RSK leaders to accept peaceful reintegration into Croatia. <coughs> Croatia has clearly proved its willingness to peacefully reintegrate its occupied territories. It did so in 1998 with Eastern Slavonia when it was successfully reintegrated into Croatia in a peaceful manner. Finally, Operation Storm made the signing of the Dayton Peace Accord possible and led to the end of the war in the region. Mr. President, members of the court, this brings me to our concluding submissions in relation to the counterclaim brought by Serbia. But before that, allow me to thank the distinguished members of the Serbian delegation I thank the registry for its assistance. I thank the interpreters and the security staff for their services during these proceedings. And finally, Mr. President, members of the court, I thank you for your attention. And now, if you allow me, I will read the final submissions of the Republic of Croatia in relation to the respondent's counterclaim. Please proceed. It's even a requirement under the rules. Please proceed. Thank you. On the basis of the facts and legal arguments presented by the applicant, it respectfully requests the International Court of Justice to adjudge and declare that in relation to the counterclaims put forward in the counter memorial, the rejoinder, and during these proceedings, it rejects in their entirety the 6th, the 7th, the 8th and the 9th submissions of the respondent on the grounds that they are not founded in fact or law. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam. The Court takes note of the final submissions which you have now read on behalf of Croatia with respect to the counterclaims of Serbia. As it took note of uh, Friday, 21st March of the final submissions of Croatia on its own claims, as well as on Friday 28 uh, March of the final submission presented by Serbia on Croatia's claims and Serbia's counterclaims. Uh, this brings us to the end of the oral proceedings. I should like to thank the agents, counsel, and advocates for their statements. In accordance with the practice, I shall request the agents of the parties to remain at the court disposal to provide any additional information it may require. With this proviso, I now declare closed the oral proceedings in the case concerning application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide 
Ser Croatia versus Serbia. The court will now retire for deliberation. The agents of the parties will be advised in due course of the date on which the court will deliver its judgment. As the court has no other business before it today, the sitting is closed.